eyes bow with me this morning. Father, this time of year, as most times of year, we are, we are often paused to think of the extraordinary gift that you gave us in your son, Jesus. And Father, I think the more that we know about the world and the more we know about life, the more we realize that we really don't understand your love and your compassion and your grace. When we look at ourselves and we look at our fellow brothers and sisters, when we look at mankind around us, we wonder, why, Father, did you, why did you bother to even, even put up with us? And yet, Lord, you not only did, but you still do. Lord, you've worked in each of our lives to accomplish your plan and your purpose. You've worked in our lives to give us an opportunity to know you for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren to be a part of your family. And Father, this morning as we open your word, I pray the Lord that we might just realize that no matter who we are here today and no matter the place that we find ourselves in, lives and you have a purpose for us being here. Father, sometimes we listen to the devil and he tells us that that our opportunity is past, that our best life can never be realized, that any good things we may have done or could have done no longer can be accomplished because of the brokenness of our story. And I just thank you, Lord, that that is not the story you tell in the birth of your son. Please, please open our hearts, Lord, to understand that for ourselves personally. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you open up the Bible to the New Testament, to the very first opening words of the New Testament, you're kind of in for a bit of an interesting introduction. <laughs> and I think probably most of us just kind of grew up with the Bible, so we don't really think about it. Matthew, yeah, it's the first book of the Bible, Matthew 1, yeah. In fact, I, I asked a few people this week, what, what is Matthew 1 about? And, and, and some of them were like, they paused and thought, and then they, was that the birth of Jesus? Well, yeah, sort of. But what specifically is in Matthew 1? I, I'm not sure if I remember. And, and that's because for most of us, Matthew 1, at least the first half of the chapter, is just kind of optional reading. We, we, we sort of just jump over it. But Matthew is writing to a very specific audience, an audience of Jewish people. An audience of Jewish people who are in a world and in a time where their holiness, their appearance of holiness at least, is so very important to them. It's this, it's this idea of, of, of wearing their phylacteries in a large manner and large, large flanges or large tassels laying off the sides of their garments. The corners of their beard dyed white so people can see that they're, they're long. They, they were big on appearances, but as Jesus described them later, he would say, you guys are rather like whitewashed tombs. You're, you're full of dead men's bones on the inside. And right into this very audience, Matthew opens up his gospel with these words. This is the family history of Jesus Christ. He came from the family of David and David from the family of Abraham. And I, I'm reading this morning from more of a paraphrased version. You can follow the traditional version on the screen behind me. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob. And Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and, and Zarah. Their mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Herzon, and Herzon was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of, um, um, I can never say this, guys, Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Solomon. Solomon was the father of Boaz, and Boaz's mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed's mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon. Solomon's mother had been Uriah's wife. And it goes on and on like that. I don't want to bore you guys reading genealogies this morning. You guys will throw things at me if you can. Some of us like genealogy and some of us find it stale, but please don't ignore that this genealogy is different than most genealogies. 
This genealogy is not just written to give us a list of names that we might identify that Jesus indeed came from the right tribe and the right family and had a connection to the throne of King David. That was a messianic prophecy, no doubt. But this prophecy was not, or this this genealogy was not just given to fulfill prophecy. It's not so much the names that he chooses to not include on that list because if you look at that list, you're going to recognize naturally there are generations of people who aren't mentioned there. They're not noteworthy. We have Abraham, we have Isaac, we have Jacob, we have David. These are people that we know their names and this was for a very specific purpose. But maybe even more than those names that aren't listed, it's very interesting the names that are. And in particular, The names of five women that will ultimately be listed in this genealogy. Now, for us, that's not a big deal because you're like, well, of course, you have a grandma and a grandpa, a mom and a dad. Why wouldn't you mention the women? But Jews never mention the women in genealogies. In fact, if you have certain versions of the Bible, you'll see that those are bracketed in parentheses because they were so... It was so unusual that the early translations kind of didn't know how to handle that. The Jews always just talked about the men because in that culture, the men were the ones that were important. But Matthew, writing to that culture, decides he's going to tell us about five women. Five women who not only were they women, which is remarkable that they made the list, but five women, none of whom really, except one, were even Jewish. So we're trying to prove the ancestry of the Messiah, the King of the Jews, and we're going to mention women, which is good, but now we're going to mention that all these women are non-Jewish? And then if you begin to pull their stories apart, you begin to realize that not only were they women in a genealogy primarily full of men, Not only were their ancestries from places other than the tribe of Abraham, (laughs) but these women, almost every one of them, were at the heart of a very dark scandal. This morning, we're going to take a look at those stories. Not so much just to give ourselves a biblical perspective from history, but more importantly, to ask ourselves the question, why would Matthew by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, write in these names? Why would he remind us of their stories? Why would God, of all the people that he could choose, why would God even choose Judah to be the tribe through whom his son would come? At first read, these are just boring names on a list, but as you begin to tie the stories that accompany them, you realize that they're far different than just boring stories. There's something more to each of these stories. and Each of these women tell a story about what God was coming to bring into this world. And it wasn't just another form of religion. It was something that was truly transformational. So let's take a look at the cast of characters that Matthew lends, uh, lays out for us here. Some of those people on that list you automatically know and you're familiar with those names. Others of those people are kind of lost to us. Their names are often scattered throughout Scripture, but they're just kind of in a footnotes. But Matthew makes a point of pointing out four women's names, concluding with Mary at the very end. And the first of those is a lady by the name of Tamar. If you want to know Tamar's story, you can turn to Genesis, the 38th chapter. Maybe this week you might want to read through it. But Tamar's story is one of the most painful stories of the Old Testament. She was married to a man that was so wicked that God had him put to death. (laughs) You can imagine that marriage. I don't know what that would be like. I've known some pretty evil people in the world but I have not really known anybody that I knew God put to death. But this, this guy was so wicked that God himself said, I am taking him out of this equation. He is not going to be a part of this story. So left childless, Tamar has a problem. And so she follows the cultural practices and she marries her husband's brother. But the brother didn't really want to share his inheritance with children that were born to her. 
And so he simply used Tamar for his sexual pleasure, but never allowed her to become a mother. And so God killed him too. Finally, Tamar is so desperate for security and for posterity, which absolutely was necessary in that day, that she dressed as a prostitute and she put herself in the path of her father-in-law, whose name happens to be Judah. Now, if some of you are getting a little uncomfortable this morning and you're squirming in your seats, I'm just telling you the story of the Savior. She ends up seducing her father-in-law, Judah, and ends up becoming pregnant and giving birth to twins, one of whom is Perez, and Perez is a part of Jesus' family tree. I don't know if there's an uglier story in the Old Testament, really, than this one. It's a story that is twisted and ugly, and the characters of it, they kind of just... Mm. They don't, they don't fit for us. You, we, we don't want to see this poor woman married to a guy that's so evil that God kills him or used for pleasure but not given what God wanted for her, which was a family. And so God had to kill another brother. Eventually, she goes to her own father-in-law, and she knows what a lousy creature he was because she recognizes that she dress up, dresses up like a prostitute, she'll be able easily to seduce him, and she does so. If you know that story, you know she keeps a couple things because if she hadn't, she would have been killed for her sin. She kept his staff and she kept his seal, and when he hauls her in in order to figure out why she became pregnant, she simply presents those items to him publicly, and he has to admit his sin. Sometimes we forget that the beautiful story of Jesus lying in a manger is not a story that is neat and tidy. It's not a story whose background is full of people who have it all together. In fact, the opposite is quite true, and Matthew here points this out deliberately to us. The second person on the list is a woman that maybe we're more familiar with. Some of us might not know the name Tamar, but we probably all have heard of the woman named Rahab. Yes, that Rahab. The Rahab that the spies met when they were sent as a part of an advance party to scout out the city of Jericho when about two million Israelites were about to come in and conquer the promised land. And Joshua did what normal leaders do. He sent some people out and he said, scope this out and tell us about what's going on. And so these guys kind of infiltrate the city, but it's not long before the people in Jericho realize that they have been infiltrated. They close the gates. They send out search parties. And these guys seek refuge in a place that would be logical for them to do so a house of ill repute, and they ask for the mercy of a woman by the name of Rahab, whom the Bible calls a prostitute. Now, some Bible scholars have tried to clean this up a little bit because, quite frankly, this story makes a lot of people uncomfortable. If you're a little uncomfortable this morning, you're in good company. We don't want to think that these kind of people were hanging on the branches of Jesus' family tree, although Matthew points them out to us. Some Bible scholars try to say, well, she was just operating a hotel. But I don't think she was operating a hotel. I think she was the madam of a brothel. And she hid the men underneath the, the roofing material in the house. And when when the, 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 the armies or the guards had gone or the police or whoever was looking for them... She said, hey, I know that your God is real. We know what he has done to the gods over the Jordan, or the armies over the Jordan River. Promise me that I might find a place among your people. And they, they had, she would lower the men down with a, a scarlet cord, and they said, hang this from your window, and when the city of Jericho is destroyed, you and everyone in your house will be spared. You know the story, right? I'm speeding this up this morning because this is an actually expansive story of the Old Testament, but, but certainly the armies, they march around the city of Jericho and the people go back. And day two, the same thing. Seven days they do this. Seventh day they march around seven times. They give a big shout. They blow the trumpets. The walls fall down except for the section of wall that happens to be where Rahab's house was. Remarkably, just for fun this morning, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but 
Jericho is a place that we do know where it is, and they've done a lot of excavations in Jericho, and they find an interesting thing, that this big, massive wall of Jericho, for some reason, kind of fell outwards. But there's one section of wall that didn't fall. I wonder whose house was there. And the remarkable part of this is, is that, that, that Rahab finds her way into the family tree of Jesus. She becomes a, a part of the Hebrew people. And she becomes a person that's listed here in Matthew, the first chapter. We go on to Ruth. He mentions Ruth. We know her name, and we're often quick to think, wow, well, why would Ruth's story be any, in, in any way scandalous? But, but that's just because we read that story, and we don't really get the cultural context. Ruth was a Moabite which meant that she traced her ancestry not to Abraham, but to his nephew, Lot. Some of you remember Lot. And things started out really well for Abraham and Lot, as you remember. I think Lot was a good guy. And, and he, he came with Abraham to go to this place that God would show him. And, and Lot seems to be game to kind of come along and join in on this. And so, so here comes Lot. Lot joins in with, with Abraham. But eventually, Lot and Abraham's employees begin to have problems with one another. And so Abraham makes a deal with Lot. He says, Lot, here's the thing. Why don't, why don't you pick? You can either have the hill country and the mountains or you can have the well-watered plain. But we, we just need to kind of divide up because our guys aren't getting along. We're both now prosperous farmers. God has blessed us both. So we're just gonna have to make that division. And it says that, that Lot looked around and he made the obvious choice to take the well-watered valley in the cities of the valley were Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says this simple word. It says that Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. In other words, every morning he got up, there was Sodom. Every evening he went to bed, there was Sodom. There's a, there's a powerful story in this text. That I just can't skip over it. And that is it, guys. The thing that you're focused on is the thing that ultimately you will accomplish. The thing that your family is focused on will ultimately be the thing that your family ends up worshiping. I don't know what that is for your family. I have to, have to plan that for my family. Where is your family's tent pitched? What is it that gets the most focus and attention in your home? Is it the Lord or is it other things in the world? Because the remarkable part of Lot's story is that while Abraham gets the kind of trashy mountain ground and he goes up there and he thrives and his, his, his flocks grow and he becomes a, a man of God after a lot of false starts, Lot ends up as one of the city leaders in Sodom. Eventually it wasn't just enough to have his tent pitched toward Sodom, but eventually Lot lived in Sodom. You guys know the story about when the angel of the Lord came and the other angels came and they had a conversation with Abraham and there was this whole thing where they, they kind of kind of this bartering deal about, well, if there's 100 and if there's 50 and there's 25 and finally if there's just 10 righteous people in this whole big city, 10 righteous people. Guys, that's unbelievable. That's the grace that our God has. If there were just 10 good people in the whole town, the angels knew there wasn't 10 good people in the town, they were just gonna go get... Abraham's nephew and his family out, probably because of their kindness toward Abraham. And so the, 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 the two angels go into the city. The angel of the Lord, as it's described, stays apparently with Abraham at the tent or returns where, where they came from. But these two angels go into the city. And of course, immediately the men come out and, and they're wanting to do terrible things with these guys. And uh, we'll just keep it PG this morning. And, uh, and, and so, and so uh, the angels strike them all with blindness. You guys know that story. And eventually sweep out Lot and his wife and his two daughters. And they said, don't even look back as, as fire from heaven begins to fall on the city. And of course, Lot's wife is just overwhelmed with curiosity and she turns, she becomes that pillar of salt. But then Lot and his two daughters, they run into the mountains and they think that they're the only people left in the world. They think the whole world's been destroyed and you can understand why. All they heard was just a, a commotion behind them, fire and brimstone falling from heaven. They think that everyone in the world is gone and so the girls end up coming up with this just absolutely sick plan. They get their father drunk and then they become pregnant with their dad. I told you that story because that's who the Moabites are. They come from that line. 
So while Ruth looks in a way to be this wonderful, sweet, beautiful girl, and in many ways she is, her story, her story and her background is very broken. And you, you sense, you sense the frustration and anger of the people of, of Bethlehem when, when Naomi returns. She and her husband Elkanah had gone to Moab during a, a famine, and they had taken their two sons with them. And while there, the two sons had married the two Moabite girls, Ruth being one of those. But eventually, death takes all the boys, both Elkanah and the two sons. And so Ruth and Naomi, along with Orpha, the other daughter-in-law, begin to make this trip home. And eventually, Orpha goes back to her people. Ruth says to Naomi, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. Just beautiful, beautiful act of devotion. But they return, and, and everyone says, oh, Naomi's come back. And when you read that text, you don't catch it. But if you read it again and you see these people are like, oh, the Moabite, the Moabite woman, she decided maybe it wasn't so nice over there in Moab, and she brings back, she brings back this girl with her. And, and it seems like she is just alienated, and she probably is. Naomi renames herself. No longer is she Naomi, but Mara, which means bitter. Right? So can you imagine this? This poor girl comes back to a group of people that don't really like her with a bitter mother-in-law. This sounds wonderful, but God was working. A guy named Boaz has favor on Naomi because he sees Ruth working in the field. He tells the guys, hey, guys, why don't you leave a little bit on the edges of the field there for her because she's kind of cute. Boaz is this wealthy unmarried farmer, right? And eventually, you guys know the little romance story that is a book of Ruth. They, they get together, and they have children, but a Moabite is, is a part of the family tree of Jesus. And then, and then Matthew chooses to remind us that just a few generations later, there was another woman who also probably wasn't Jewish, and if she was Jewish, she had kind of given up her Jewish identity because she was married to a guy by the name of Uriah, and her name, of course, is Bathsheba, and many of us know that story, right? The story of, of David and Bathsheba, Uriah, one of David's mighty men, one of his loyal soldiers, a guy that was actually a Hittite who were a member of the tribe of people that had dominated the land of Canaan prior to the arrival of the, of the Hebrew people. And, and, uh, and when David was out in the middle of, uh, when David was running from Saul, the Bible says that God sent him all kinds of people, all the rejects from all different tribes around. If you didn't fit in anywhere, then you could come and join up with David. And God created out of that band of misfits what I think is we look back now and see as David's mighty men. If you ever read through that section of scripture, most of those guys were not Hebrew. Most of them were from other countries. And I think those are the guys that met with David back at that point in time. But here's the point. Uriah has married this beautiful woman by the name of Bathsheba, and because he's such a prominent part of David's military force, he has a house right next door to the palace, which works out really well until the king decides that he's not going to be about doing what he's supposed to be doing, which is leading his people, but he's going to sit at home and get idle late at night in front of the computer, or, well, no, he's going to get, late, he's going to get idle late at night on his rooftop. And for whatever reason, the neighbor lady's out there bathing. Maybe this is normal. It's no excuse for David. David was a man of God. David should have gone into the house or sent someone over and said, hey, uh, I, was, I was out on my roof. Can you uh, hurry up? But what does David do? He summons her over. And I don't really think she had a whole lot of say in that matter. In that time when the king said, you did. And she becomes pregnant. And of course, David tries to cover that up by bringing Uriah home. But Uriah is a better man than he is. Uriah said, I can't go into my house and enjoy my family when all the rest of my brothers are on the battlefield right now and may die. So he sleeps on the steps of the temple. And then he takes back to Joab, the commander of David's army, a letter from David, sealed and stamped. And David knew he was such an honest man, he would never open the letter. And the letter was his own death sentence. Put Uriah in the heat of the battle and then everyone back away and just let him get cut down. It's exactly what happens to Uriah. And Matthew says, oh yeah, Bathsheba, she was the, father, the mother of Solomon. 
Finally, he concludes this genealogy with Mary, and we've talked about her story, so we won't belabor that point, but Mary, even in the eyes of the people at that time, was kind of the center of a, <laughs> of a scandal in a sense. She was impregnated by the Holy Spirit, and I don't know how many people believe that story. We know it to be true, but five women, five women whose stories are tortured, Tamar, who went through a miserable kind of story. And why would she be there? Rahab, a, a prostitute. Why would, why would Matthew say, oh, and there was Rahab, she was in there. Or, or, or Ruth, uh, she, was, she was descended from a tribe of people that, whose origin was incest. Or, or, or Bathsheba, I mean, she was a part of one of the biggest scandals that's ever happened in mankind. I don't think there's been an affair that's been better publicized, more talked about, or preached in the history of mankind than David and Bathsheba. It's, what, 3,500 years later? We're still talking about it. Or Mary. Why would, why would Matthew include this story? I think that answer is simple. I think most of us know it this morning. But I think it's important that we be reminded of it. Christ came into the world to take the shame of his own family tree. And our family tree as well. Christ came into this world not to minister to the well, but to the sick, to those who were broken. There can be a tendency among all of us to want to forget that we are broken. It's a tendency for all of us to kind of think that, that church should just become kind of a, an organization of people who have figured it out, and we get together every Sunday to celebrate how figured out we have things. And I think that Matthew is, is writing in his genealogy to a group of people who really kind of prescribed to that ideology. The Jewish people really kind of wanted everyone to think they were a little bit better than everybody else. And I think Matthew is writing and he's saying, you know what, you're Messiah. <laughs> the Son of God came into this world in a family tree that was full of broken people. Just like you guys are broken. Just like we are broken. Jesus came from a long line of outsiders and outlaws and scoundrels and sinners. And when he entered into this world, he entered into the messiness of a human family, even in his own family. I mean, you think about what happens later on in Jesus' ministry. His own brothers and sisters don't believe him, right? They, 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 they went specifically so they could take him home. I think they thought that Jesus had lost his mind. They're like, we need to go get our brother and bring him back because he, he says he's the Messiah, There's this passage that the writer of Hebrews shares with us. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, in verse number two, after finishing this, this chronicle of the heroes of our faith, some of whom are listed in Matthew, the 12th chapter, or in Matthew, the first chapter, the writer of Hebrews says, This is our marching orders, fixing our eyes on Jesus, which is. Our focal point. Lot was looking at Sodom. Lot was looking at the world around. But the writer of Hebrews says, hey, we need to get our blinders on. We need to focus our eyes on Jesus, the author or the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Some of your versions say the author and perfecter. What it means is it's a guy who showed us how to do it. He's the guy that introduced us and showed us what the Christian faith looks like. The author and the perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning it's shame. Some of us this morning have lived our lives completely controlled by shame. We aren't doing the things that God has called us to do. We're afraid to step out and to take the bold steps that God may be leading us to. We can't get over things that have happened to us or things that we have done in the past because of shame. Christ came in this world, and he scorned that shame. Christ came into the world not just to be born as a little baby in a manger, but ultimately he came to hang beaten and broken and naked on a cross so that by his sacrifice, we might have forgiveness and freedom. 
And not just us, but all those generations of broken people before him and all the generations of people that would follow. The writer of Hebrews reminded us, though, that Jesus didn't just stay in that place of shame. He scorned its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When you think back at that list or some of the characters that are a part of the stories that we looked at, think about Abraham. Think about Abraham's shame when he allows his fears of foreign dignitaries and powerful men in the world around him to put his wife in a compromising situation. If you know the story of Abraham, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, sometime read that. He goes to Egypt, and the, the, the king of Egypt looks and says, eh, you got a good-looking wife. I don't know what genes Sarah came from, but she's pretty old at this point. She's in her 60s or 70s, and she's still turning the heads of kings. And Abraham's fearful. He doesn't protect his wife. He puts her in a compromising situation. But Jesus bore that shame. He hung on the cross, even though Jesus will always protect his bride. Think of Jacob's shame. For his lifetime, Jacob was a deceiver. That's what his name means. And Jacob lived up to that name. But Jesus bore the shame of Jacob and the generations of deceivers that would follow. And though he always told the truth, in fact, he was the truth, he would be he would be killed as one who told lies. We talked a little bit about Judah before. It's remarkable that we read from the tribe of Judah, the Savior, the Messiah will come, and then you're introduced to Judah, and you're like, oh my, this was not a righteous fellow. This was not the kind of guy that I would want my Lord to come from. This was the kind of guy that his daughter-in-law knew could be seduced by a prophet or a prostitute, maybe not a prophet, a prostitute with a high degree of reliability. I mean, she put herself out here knowing this would happen. And she knew, too, that he would put her to death to save his family shame unless she secured some way to prove to him that it was he that was the guilty party. Not only did he have that shameful part of his story, but Judah was one who sold his own brother into slavery, Joseph. Lied to a grieving father for years and years, up to 20 years, lied to his dad and watched every year as his dad grieved the death of a son that they knew wasn't dead and yet never said a word. This is the kind of guy Judah was. And yet Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> You think of King David's shame. It hung around him like a prison sentence for the rest of his life. His family was destroyed. His peace was destroyed. His name and reputation in many ways was forever tainted by that terrible affair that he had with Bathsheba. And yet as we consider all the people who are part of the family of Jesus... We recognize that they were members, proudly listed, or I don't know proudly listed, but listed by Matthew, their names drawn out to remind us of something, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever might believe in him would not perish, but might have everlasting life. Church, the, the challenge for us in the time of year that we're in is that we've got to point out to the world that Jesus is not just a little baby. He's not just a celebration that we celebrate in the cold parts of the year with cute songs and pretty lights and gifts that we give to one another. The real gift that we need is not underneath a tree, but it hung on a tree. The real gift that we need in this broken and messed up world, every single one of us, is the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul said this to Timothy, and maybe there's never been truer words spoken in Scripture. He said, this saying is trustworthy and it deserves full acceptance. <laughs> if you want to know something true, Paul says, listen up that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 
That was his purpose. May I just remind us all this morning, church, our job isn't to save the sinners, but our job is to let the sinners know about the Savior. And that requires that sometimes we we put ourselves in the footsteps of Jesus. We walk in the shoes of the author and perfecter of our faith. You know, one of the most powerful prophecies, and we'll close with this this morning, that's ever been delivered is Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. So powerful, in fact, that for generations, Bible critics said that it undoubtedly was written after the death of Jesus. It was written to support the narrative of the crucifixion because obviously the person who wrote Isaiah 53 knew exactly what was going to happen to Jesus. And that was a common theme in the age of biblical skepticism until a Bedouin boy broke some glass jar or some pottery jars in a cave in Qumran. And one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of, of all time was discovered in that they found what we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And while most of the Dead Sea Scrolls are fragments and bits and pieces, there's one scroll written and sealed away long before Jesus lived that is almost completely intact. And I don't think that's an accident. It's called the Isaiah Scroll. And written on the pages or the sheets of vellum there are these words in Hebrew. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form, he had no majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and he was rejected by men, a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him as stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement or the punishment that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I don't know why Matthew wrote the story that he wrote in the opening pages of his gospel. But I bet if we could ask him, he would tell us it's because Jesus' family tree was made by God to look a lot like your family tree and mine. I have some of the same sins in my family tree. I don't know my family history, but I know that I was born in a home for unwed mothers, which means that somewhere along the line, probably a couple good kids made a mistake and I was a result. And I th- am so thankful that my mother didn't choose to do away with me in abortion. I'm also so thankful that my mother made no doubt the most difficult choice of her life to give me up for adoption, to be born, or to be given to a family that was able and ready and prepared to raise a son. But my, my family tree has a few skeletons. My family tree is full of brokenness, and maybe yours is too. And maybe some of that brokenness is yours, as much of that brokenness is mine. This morning, Jesus Christ came to die for those sins. And if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, if you've never made a decision to have your sins washed away, what are you waiting for? I know it feels a little shameful to have to step out. Maybe some of us are older here this morning and say, you know what, I've lived 50 years and I've never really made an admittance that I'm a broken person, but but come on. Jesus did a lot more shameful thing than we ever will have to. What is it that's holding you back this morning? 
If it's something that you need to talk through with one of us, we would love to do that. But if it's the fact that you look at your life and you think to yourself, you know what, no one knows the person that I am. No one knows what I've done. No one knows the brokenness that's a part of my story. Well, listen to me, please, this morning. You are not alone. Matthew writes what he writes in Matthew, the first chapter, to remind us that all of us have fallen away. All of us have sinned. All of us are in need of a Savior. And maybe there's some of us in this room this morning that have just been with the Lord so long, we've started to believe that we're just a little better than everyone else. Matthew, the first chapter, reminds us that we all are a part of the family of humanity, that we all broken people. All of us have gone astray. And all of us need a good shepherd to bring us home. We're going to stand together this morning and we're going to sing. And if you need to come and just say, you know what, today's the day. Fill up the baptistry, Jason. It's time for me to have these sins washed away. It's time for me to walk with the Lord in the new life. Please come. If you need to talk with one of us, don't leave the building today until you've done that. And if maybe today you're one of those people where you're just like, you know what, I... (laughs) I need to make good on this. Let's make good on it. Let's become the people that God's called us to be. Church, let's stand together and let's sing. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be Lest I forget Thy thorn crown brow Lead me to Calvary Lest I forget Gethsemane Lest I forget Thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light of rain guarded thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget. Thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. I'm here to remember what Jesus did for us. And as we're seated this morning, I just want to welcome Mr. Mike. He's going to prepare our hearts to remember what it is that Jesus did for us when he died on the cross.